All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I will pray for us. Father, I thank you for giving us today at Bryan College. I thank you for the challenge of understanding your word. Um, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you opened the disciples' minds to the scriptures and that through the Holy Spirit, you can open our minds to the scriptures today. I pray that as we look at a difficult passage in the Old Testament, that you would uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts that would love you and love other people, feet that would walk in your ways, hands that would do your work in the world. I pray you help us today as we look at your word, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So I do invite you to take the attendance quiz. Thank you for uh, doing that. It makes it uh, very easy to keep track of uh, attendance in this class. Today we're looking at something very unusual in Scripture. We're looking at the idea of circumcision and the meta narrative of Scripture. And of all the things that is difficult to understand in the Bible, perhaps one of uh, the uh, most difficult is to try to understand what God intends through this act of circumcision the act of uh, cutting away the foreskin of uh, uh, Jewish man's genitalia, why in the world would God pick that as a sign? And so with any uh, difficult thing in Scripture, we want to just look at the different texts. Uh, some of the texts are easy to understand. Some are very difficult. But we'll dive in. And perhaps one of the orienting passages might be this one in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Uh, this is a promise from God. Uh, Moses had led the people of Israel 40 years. He had written down all the stories uh, in the Scripture, in the Pentateuch, he was giving his last sermon to the people. He was saying that the reason that this hasn't worked is because you need something else. You need more than just the promises of blessing. You need more than the threatenings for disobedience. You need more than the miracles. Uh, to see those miracles, you need more than me as your leader, Moses said, what you need is for God to circumcise your heart. And so just a few minutes before Moses died, as he's closing his very last sermon, knowing that at the end of that sermon that God would end his life on earth, this is what Moses said, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. And these final words, this dying declaration of God's prophetic um, leader is that what you need is for God to cut away something from you, uh, to cut away something that is intimately connected to you, and to do it not only to you, but to your offspring. And the result of that spiritual circumcision that is being promised by Moses is that when God cuts away this filth-causing thing in you, the result will be that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. 
uh, this is the picture of people being conformed to life with God in renewed Eden. Moses says, what you need is for God to cut away something from you. The result will be you'll love God with all your heart, you'll love God with all your soul, and when you love God with all your heart and soul, the result of that is that happily you'll live forever with God. Moses, as his dying declaration says, that's what you need. And so when we're thinking about all the difficult text associated with circumcision in the Bible, perhaps this promise in Deuteronomy is an orienting text where we can put a lot of these passages together. And as we think about this uh, filth-causing thing in us, uh, as we think about something that we have inherited uh, because of the natural procreation, we can think of a passage like Psalm 51, 5. And this passage is after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba, after he, in spiritual hypocrisy, had murdered his neighbor to try and cover up his sin. Um, at, when he's pleading with God to create in him a clean heart, this is what David says of himself. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, David is saying the moment that I came into existence, I was in iniquity. The moment that I was conceived, I was a sinner, and not just a little sinner, but an adulterer, murdering, uh, spiritually hypocritical sinner. And David, as the eighth son of his mother, he's not saying that somehow that procreative act on the part of his parents was somehow illegitimate. It was totally legitimate. Uh, they were married. They had been married a long time. But David is saying, when I was conceived as a child, even though I was born to believing parents, nevertheless, it's true that I was brought forth in iniquity. I was brought forth in spiritual dirtiness. I was brought forth with filth in the center of my soul. And that was true the moment my mother conceived me. And the New Testament makes that exact same claim in Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. And Paul says of us all, he says of himself, you were dead in the trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Because every person who is born from natural procreation is the product, the natural son of dead Adam and dead Eve, spiritually dead Adam, spiritually dead Eve, uh, because even the children of believers is produced by a fallen uh, flesh that's still in this world, the result is that every single person from the moment of conception is born as uh, someone who is dirty before God. There is no idea in the Bible of somehow that we are born innocent and that we are born good and somehow learn to do evil. The opposite is true, that we are born spiritually stillborn and that we have a problem that is connected with the very procreation uh, of ourselves. And so when we think about circumcision and this strange act that somehow uh, connected with male procreation, um, as we think about circumcision and that being a spiritual picture of God cutting away, perhaps that gives us a little bit of a strategy for understanding these texts. So these are the texts 
Where is circumcision first mentioned in the Bible? It's first mentioned with Abraham. Uh, God says, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. This is my covenant. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. So God sets up that every single person who's going to be connected with the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, every single person who would ever be incorporated into that nation from foreigners, here is the covenant. The covenant is that the male members uh, of uh, all the people who are incorporated into Israel, they must be circumcised. And I don't know about you, but I have some questions at this point. God reveals this to Abraham. This is part of God's grace to Abraham. And as I'm reading the text, there are a number of questions that I would naturally have. One is, how difficult would it be for a man who's 100 years old uh, to go through the process of circumcision. I did not uh, put these ancient pictures in the text, but there are actually ancient uh, pictures on pottery, uh, Egyptian pictures of people being circumcised. And in one of those pictures, there's a man who is uh, completely naked and he's being circumcised. And as he's being circumcised in this ancient picture, another man is standing behind him and holding him, uh, holding his arms because what he's about to undergo is dreadfully, uh, almost deathly painful. How difficult would it be for Abraham to, uh, as a hundred year old man, um, and this is the, the most sensitive part of a person's body, uh, how difficult would it be for Abraham to undergo circumcision? And secondly, how could God ask Abraham to do that? This seems to be uh, incredibly difficult, what God is asking Abraham to do. And a third question is why? is the sign male only. Um, there, there are a number of signs that you could have. You could uh, have tattoos. You could do something else. But this is a male only sign. And it's a massively bloody sign. And it's an incredibly painful sign. How could God implement this as a covenant a covenant that he insists must be practiced forever. But the text tells us that Abraham uh, was circumcised, Ishmael was 13 years old, and he was circumcised. And then 17 years later, when Isaac was born, he was circumcised as God commanded on the eighth day. And we might ask, why would God uh, command that it be done on the eighth day? What's significant about the eighth day, the first day of the second week? When we look at other circumcision texts in the Bible, it becomes even stranger uh, in Genesis 34, we have the horrific story of the rape of Dinah. And Dinah was a sister to 
um, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And it says she was walking one day in the pagan cities where they were dwelling, and a man named Shechem uh, wanted to be with her sexually. And so he seized her and he raped her. And um, he, we're told in the story, repented. And uh, it says he spoke tenderly to her heart. Uh, how many times has that act been repeated throughout human history where a man does this horrible thing and then tries to make it right by speaking to a woman's heart? That's what's going on here when Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers here, uh, it says that they talked the men into being circumcised. And when they were on the third day, as they were in this incredible pain trying to recover from the process of uh, this procedure, it says Simeon and Levi took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure, and they killed all the males. They slaughtered them, uh, I believe it says in Hebrew. And they killed Hamor, which is Shechem's father, and they killed Shechem with a sword, and they took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and they went away. And the sons of Jacob came to the slain and plundered the city, because they had defiled their sister, and they took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city, and in all the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives. All that was in the houses they captured and plundered. So here we have this horrific uh, uh, story, narrative of the men of Shechem and of this prince of Shechem um, raping Dinah and then Levi using circumcision as a way to uh, exact vengeance on the city. Here this poor woman had been sexually abused and Levi's solution is to use this practice of circumcision to use it as a way to murder the city and to plunder the goods and to take all the wives from all the men who were slain. What in the world is this about? When we come to Exodus 4, the plot thickens because there God had previously appeared to Moses and had sent him to Egypt to lead the people out of captivity. Moses was in the process of obeying God. And then strangely in Exodus 4, it says as Moses is on the journey in obedience to God, it says as a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. In other words, he was obeying what God had told him to do, and as he's obeying, the Lord meets him and almost kills him because of circumcision. Notice what the text says, for he had not circumcised his own sons, and um, he said when he gave the covenant to Abraham, if you do not circumcise your own sons, then you will be cut off from the people. And so Zipporah, Moses' wife, knowing this, uh, took a flint knife and circumcised her son's foreskin and touched the feet of Moses with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. You are a bloody bridegroom. And so the Lord let Moses alone. It was then that she said a bridegroom of blood because of circumcision. And when you read that story, you think, what in the world is this about? Moses is obeying God, and God almost kills him because he's not circumcised his two 
sons. Um, when we read the whole story, it's a little unclear to me, but this event uh, may result in the divorce of Zipporah and uh, Moses. It, as I read the text, it looks like that Moses ends up marrying a Cushite woman, a woman from Ethiopia, and this woman is sent away. And when it says she was sent away, it's the normal Hebrew word used for uh, divorcing one's spouse. And so we come to this issue, and the question is, why is God killing Moses uh, over this? And what is this whole touched his feet and bridegroom of blood? I don't understand what this is about. Perhaps you can relate to that as a reader. When we come to Exodus uh, 12 and the regulations for Passover, this is as God is delivering the people from slavery in Egypt. The text says, if a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. So if you want entry into the kingdom of God and you're a male, then you have to undergo this horrific ordeal of circumcision. And then the text says, then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native in the land. Once he's circumcised, he's going to be a Jew just as much as anyone is a Jew. And then God says, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of the Passover. So it seems as if this uh, practice of circumcision is significant. And we as readers, intelligent readers of the text, need to ask the question, why? Why is this so important to God? How am I to understand this right? When we come to Leviticus uh, 12, this sheds light on, um, well, when we come to Leviticus 12, um, this is a strange regulation about uh, circumcision and, and uh, childbirth. So this is a sp speaking of a woman who has a male child. And the regulation in Leviticus 12 says, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, that is the child's foreskin, shall be circumcised. Uh, his uh, foreskin will be cut off. And then his mother, it says this, then she, she will continue for 33 days in the blood of her purifying. She shall not touch anything holy nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying are completed. In other words, strangely, uh, if a woman has a male baby, then that woman is unclean for 40 days. That seems very strange to me. Why, why would that be? But then, uh, baff, uh, bafflingly, it says, but if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean for two weeks. As during her menstruation, she shall continue in the blood of her purifying for 66 days. In other words, if a woman, a Jewish woman, has a girl baby, then uh, the girl baby does not receive the sign, and the mother is unclean for 80 days. Now, if I just take a poll, how many of you would agree at this point in the discussion that this is a very deep hole uh, in terms of interpretation? Um, this, I mean, how many of you have ever sat through a sermon uh, on circumcision or a Bible study on circumcision or even 
looking at any of these passages, strange passages, about circumcision, would, would you agree that this is a difficult text and a difficult idea? Well, I'm trying to convince you of a Christocentric, metanarratival, plot-symmetrical approach to the Old Testament. Um, the New Testament writers call it typology. Uh, we might call it a macro-typological approach to the Old Testament where all the features, all the uh, details are somehow designed by God to point forward to Jesus. And I'm going to try to make the argument that once we see what's going on, that this Bible study, which clearly up until this point has been very, very difficult and very confusing, um, I believe that our Bible study will turn into something massively beautiful and massively inviting. But at this point, uh, I'm under the assumption that you are all agreeing with me that this is a difficult, difficult text, a difficult idea. Deuteronomy 10, um, in the early part of Moses' final sermon, uh, I speak a little slowly. On a, in a good minute, I think I can speak about a hundred words. If you take that level and apply it to Moses' sermon in Deuteronomy, he preached for about four and a half hours. Uh, he preached for four and a half hours and then he died. This is in the early part of that sermon. And in the early part, Moses says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your own heart. Moses says what other writers in the Old Testament say, and that is circumcise yourself. And I want you to imagine, if you're a, a male, the difficulty it would be of physically circumcising yourself. I can't think of anything more impossible than the idea uh, through this searing, uh, shooting pain, this uh, area of a, per a man's body that's so sensitive uh, to try to come up with a way to circumcise yourself. This is in an era when there is no local anesthesia. It's just you and the knife. And Moses is saying, circumcise yourself. Circumcise your own heart. Cut away the thing in your heart that's causing filth. Moses, in the early part of the sermon, says, For the Lord your God is a God of gods, and Lord of lords, great and the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial. He won't take a bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless. The widow loves the sojourner, gives him food and clothing. I love the sojourner, therefore, for you are sojourners in the land of, of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him. You shall hold fast to him. By his name you will swear. Moses is saying, look, get your act together. Get your spiritual act together. Fix yourself. Fix what's wrong with you on the inside because God is an impartial judge. God knows the secret sins. God knows what you're like when everyone sees. God knows what you're like when everyone doesn't see. And God will not take a bribe. Fix yourself. Cut away the thing in your heart that's causing you to sin. And if you're like me, you hear that and you want to reply to Moses, Moses, I can't. It's too painful to circumcise myself. I need to be circumcised by someone else. I need to be circumcised by God. And so at the end of Moses' sermon, that's what he promises. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. When we come to the New Testament, there's a contrast between physical circumcision and circumcision of the heart. Uh, David, when 
he saw his own sin, when he saw that in spite of the fact that he had written psalms in worshiping God, uh, in spite of the fact that he was king of Israel, in spite of the fact that he was anointed, David recognized in the Bathsheba incident that he was just as lustful as anyone who had ever lived. And when he was on the roof of his house in a time where kings should be away at war, he decided to let other people fight the Lord's battle. He decided that somehow he was exempt. And as he walked on the roof of his house, he saw a beautiful naked woman bathing in the afternoon. And when we hear of that, uh, one, the question that comes to my mind is why would a beautiful woman bathe naked on her roof in the middle of the day, knowing that her roof was in uh, eyesight of the king's walkway. Uh, I think that as guilty as David was, that Bathsheba was guilty. And the text says that uh, David decided to act on this beautiful naked woman that he saw, and he sent his servants and he took her. Uh, Uriah was one of the 30 fighting men, one of the best 30 men in the army. He was a, a pagan convert. He was Uriah the Hittite. And he fought uh, the battles of David. But David didn't care about that. David only knew that uh, Uriah's wife was a very beautiful woman. David was married to um, many women. Uh, I've counted it up one time. I can't remember the, the exact number. But he had lots of wives. But he didn't want to be with one of his wives. He wanted to be with Uriah's wife. And so he summoned her, and they slept together. We don't know if it was the one time or the many times, but the text tells us that she became pregnant. And so David decided that he would do an abominable thing, and that is he would send for Uriah to come home and sleep with his wife and to pass off his own illegitimate son as Uriah's legitimate son. And Uriah comes home, but the difference between Uriah and David is that Uriah won't sleep with his own wife while the battles of the Lord are being fought. And so when that doesn't work, David realizes that Uriah is a um, noble man, and so he tries plan B. And plan B is, I'll get Uriah drunk. And surely when Uriah is drunk, his inhibitions, his nobility will be lessened. And then he'll sleep with his wife and I can pass off my illegitimate child as his own. And uh, David does that, but still Uriah won't, um, won't uh, agree. And so David tries the third plan. And that is rather to confess his sin and uh, humble himself before the Lord and humble himself before Uriah, he decides, I'll just kill Uriah. And uh, I would feel guilty if I murdered him myself, but I'll have him uh, placed in battle and then he will fall by the sword and I won't be a murderer. So he sends this faithful servant with a written document that ensures his own death. And once Uriah dies, then David takes Bathsheba. And I think it's important for us to see that Bathsheba is not innocent because uh, though she cries her eyes out for her dead husband Uriah, she nevertheless sleeps uh, uh, with the man who was his murderer. And she loves the man who was his murderer for the rest of his life. What the New Testament is pointing out is that the seeds of corruption that led David to do that are the exact same seeds of corruption that every single person has at birth. Um, we as religious people um, face a horrible temptation the temptation of believing somehow 
that we're saved because we're inherently better than other people. Isn't that how it works? You start going to church, uh, you uh, turn your back on uh, life, your previous life of sin, um, you start walking with the Lord, and the temptation, the great temptation is that somehow inherently I'm a better person than the people who aren't saved. Uh, I, in and of myself, I, in my flesh, am a better person than the people who aren't saved. And the Bible won't let us believe that lie. That is a lie. Our flesh is rotten. Uh, the same seeds of corruption that led David to his hypocrisy and murder and adultery and lust is the exact same seeds of corruption that exist in all of our hearts from the moment we're conceived. We inherently are not any better than the people who are unsaved. The difference is that God has taken away our heart of stone and given us a true heart of flesh, that God has cut away the filth-causing thing in us from procreation, and he's given us a new orientation in life. Eventually, that new orientation will completely take over who we are when we are in heaven and see Jesus. But before that time, we live in this world with a new heart, but the remnants of that same fallen flesh. Uh, that's why Paul can say, I know that in me, and then he qualifies it, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Paul w was willing to say, in terms of my flesh, I'm a rotten person. In terms of the uh, seeds of corruption that I inherited in Adam, I'm, I've got problems. Um, that's a pretty normal approach to the Christian life that at the core of who you are, you want to obey, uh, you want to follow, but you, you have these leftovers. You have this leftover lust and this leftover anger and this leftover selfishness uh, that God is having you fight against in this life. Uh, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's what Romans 8 says. And so... Uh, when we're thinking about this idea of circumcision, the circumcision of the heart we saw is what it's all pointed to, Deuteronomy 30. And circumcision of the heart, creation of the new heart, is what even David was pleading when he says, uh, uh, Bara in me, a God, uh, just as uh, God created uh the heavens and the earth, Bereshit bara Elohim, bara, bara in me, a clean heart. And it takes a clean heart, we're told by Jesus, to see God. So when we look at, when we continue to look at these passages, it isn't like circumcision is some kind of peripheral thing. It's there throughout the Old Testament. Um, the people of Israel had not circumcised their babies during the 40 years in the wilderness. God had told them to. God had almost killed Moses over not circumcising. But the people had not obeyed. And so when they're entering the promised land under Joshua, um, the text says this, when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua today, I have rolled away the reproach of Israel from you. And so the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal means something in Hebrew like roll away. And so what had happened is all these male babies that had been born during the 40 years of the wilderness, they were all circumcised uh, on that same day as they entered the promised land. But every time I read this text in Hebrew, there's something that strikes me uh, with this phrase, until they were healed. Because when I read it in Hebrew, that's not what it says. 
uh, it says something slightly different. Um, and um, there may be folks in here who've read Hebrew and who can vouch whether or not this is right or not. But as I read this text, it says uh, they sat uh, there in the camp until, and then literally it says they came back alive. How painful was this for 40-year-old men to be um, circumcised? Well, the text says that for three days they would rather be dead than go through what they're going through. They were in such pain that it was as if they were dead people. They sat there three days until they came back alive. Uh, Hayah. Is, is that right, Ben, uh, from the, uh, I, I don't know if you've read uh, that uh, before, but this is from the uh, verb come alive, and so it's re-come alive until they came back to life. It's translated until they were healed, which is uh, what it means, but I think it falls short of this idea that somehow they were as good as dead uh, for the first three days when this uh, happened. Uh, Jeremiah 4.4 4 says, Circumcise yourself to the Lord. Jeremiah is preaching the same sermon Moses preached. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of J Jerusalem, lest, this is God speaking, my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it. Uh, Jeremiah is preaching the law. He's plowing the hard hearts with the statement just fix yourself just try to fix this pollution at the core of who you are and then finally we come to the good news of the new testament and what we find there is that at the end of eight days when he was circumcised and the he there is jesus god incarnate yahweh incarnate Yahweh who commanded uh, Abraham to undergo circumcision. Yahweh incarnate, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. If you've ever seen a child, um, when a child is circumcised, um, it's a pitiful thing to watch because this child is born, it's helpless, it's there it's completely oblivious and it's laying there and the doctor comes in and circumcises a child and you have never seen a baby scream like going from uh, blissful ignorance to uh, all of a sudden what in the world has happened just uh, and if you've ever seen a baby uh, when the baby is circumcised uh, sized there is this scream that just comes from that it's just a whole body um, um, t taking over that a child. And blessed um, uh, feature is because it happens so early that the child never remembers it. No, no one who is circumcised as a child remembers that pain, but when it happens, it's painful. And Jesus, as the God-man, underwent circumcision on the eighth day. And then the text says, you will call his name Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And the name Jesus, you may or may not know, in Greek is the word Iesus. And Iesus is the Greek trans of the name Yeshua, Joshua. Uh, just as Moses couldn't get the people in the promised land, but Joshua took them in and they were circumcised. Here we have Jesus uh, as the ultimate uh, new Moses, as the ultimate uh, Joshua going into the land. And he's called Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, from the dirtiness of soul that they inherited at birth. 
that somehow what Jesus is doing is undergoing something that is going to fix this dirtiness of soul that all his people struggle with. Romans 2.25 says this, For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. So the deal was if you're part of God's people, you, if you're a male, you undergo circumcision. But then the Mosaic Covenant is in force. And the Mosaic Covenant says do this and live. If you're perfectly obedient to the law, then God will let you live in the land flowing with milk and honey. Paul points that out and says circumcision is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. You deconvert from Judaism. You become guilty. You become an exile from the Garden of Eden. And then Paul says this, So if a man who is uncircumcised but keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. In other words, you can be circumcised all you want. If it's just an outward act, it will do you no good. You're not a Jewish person simply because you're circumcised outwardly. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. Paul is saying God gave this right, but it was never about the physical right. It was never about the external right. The one who is a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision, isn't this the point of Moses' sermon? Circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man. His praise is from God. This is talking about Gentiles who've undergone heart circumcision. And Paul, coming to this church in Rome that faced a spiritual racism where the uh, Jewish Christians looked on themselves as somehow inherently better than the ethnic Gentiles. And Paul's saying, look, if you think you're ethnically better, then have you fully um, followed the law? And if you haven't fully followed the law, then your circumcision doesn't do you one bit of good. What does do good is circumcision of the heart. God cutting away not physical foreskin, God cutting away the pollution of soul that we inherited at birth. Galatians 5.2 uh, has the same point. There were people teaching in Paul's day that if you wanted to be saved as a Gentile Christian, then believe in Christ and repent of your sins and be baptized. But unless you were circumcised, you weren't really saved. And Paul says that people who teach that are cursed. He says, if you teach that, you have, you have stepped away from the gospel. And so Paul says it this way, Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. If you want to be saved by the Mosaic Covenant, it's really easy. Be circumcised and then never sin. And Paul knows that nobody's going to do that. Nobody has ever done that except the Lord Jesus, who was circumcised and who never sinned once in thought, word, or deed. Paul is saying that the only true Israelite who ever lived was Jesus. For he's the only one who ever followed the law. He says, you're cut off from Christ. 
you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither is circumcision nor uncircumcision, which counts for anything, but only this, faith working through love. Paul's saying it was never about the physical act of circumcising uh, males. It was always about circumcision of the heart. Galatians 6.13 says this, For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. This is a, a standard um, teaching. Everyone says it. Uh, Peter says it. Paul says it. Um, those who are ethnic Jews, do they keep the Mosaic law? And the absolute affirmative answer by all the um, New Testament writers is they do not. No one fully keeps the law. And so the position is, if that's true, then your circumcision doesn't count because you're not a Jewish person anymore. You have become non-Jewish by your rebellion. But they who desire to have you circumcised, they do it. They, they might boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by which the world was crucified to me, and I crucified to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but what does count for something is this, a new creation. What circumcision was always about was the cutting away of filth and the creation of a new creation. But we might ask, okay, uh, you might say to me, Judge, you've, you've helped me see that this is a meta narrative theme, but it's still bloody, it's still painful, it's still male only. And what about that whole thing with uh, uh, Levi using uh, circumcision to plunder a whole town? You haven't helped me with that. Well, uh, I'm trying to argue a position that a meta narrative Christocentric approach will explain even the difficult things in Scripture. So, will it explain these difficult things? Why is it bloody? Why is it painful? Why is it male only? Could it be because God was creating a right that would look forward to a painful, bloody, male-only event that would somehow fix the pollution that we have from birth? Philippians 3.3 3 says, We are the circumcision. We who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Why is it that God accepts me? Is it because I'm a good person? Is it because I've preached sermons or learned Greek and Hebrew or have had my kids baptized? Well, all those things are true. But the truth is, the corrupt part of my being, the seeds of pollution that are still there, are absolutely rotten. If you, if if we were in uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium in the Georgia Dome, and we were at some kind of religious worship service, and we were all sitting together in the middle row on the floor, and my life came uh, on the projection screen there, and it was a YouTube video of all the low points in my life, I can tell you what I would do. I would get out from that row and I would start running for the exits and you would never, ever, ever see my face again because I would be so ashamed of my sin being exposed. And I would like to make the argument that the same thing would be true of you if you were sitting there and 
the low points in your life were suddenly plastered for all the world to see, you you would leave that and you would you would change your name, you would alter the way you appear, and you would hope that no one would ever see you again. But the truth is that for all who are saved, that we have been saved by the circumcision of Jesus. We've been saved by the painful, bloody act that he endured by undergoing the Mosaic Law and then undergoing the hell that you and I deserved for our breaking of God's law over and over again. We are the circumcision who worship and glory in Christ and who put no confidence in the flesh. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I'm not inherently a good person. What I brought to the salvation table was lack and want and sin and rebellion and gross stuff. And what God gave me was a new heart and Jesus' righteousness. And he took away the center of that corrupt thing and he put inside me the righteousness of Christ. And eventually that's going to take over whom I, who I am. But in me, what I brought, I brought none of that. I was given that by grace. I put no confidence. Um, uh, I hope you'll never hear me preaching myself. I hope you will always hear me preaching the glories of the Lord Jesus. And we have this passage, in him you were circumcised. When Jesus, if you're one with Jesus, in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. The putting off of the body of the flesh. What was Jesus' plan for killing our old man? His plan was this. He would unite with it. And then he would allow himself to be murdered. And by being murdered, he would put to death once and for all the thing that uh, kept us under bondage forever. By the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, now baptism is replacing circumcision. What was a painful, bloody male only is somehow connected with baptism, which is a painless, bloodless male and female rite. Why? Because we're looking back to a cleansing that happened in the person of Jesus, in which you also were raised with him through faith. If you're uh, in Jesus, Jesus in heaven right now has a flesh for you that is completely obedient to God. A flesh that completely loves the Lord. It's God with all its heart, soul, mind, and strength. A flesh that loves its neighbors. It's already existing in heaven, united with Christ. And our life on earth is just Jesus more and more through the means of grace giving us that life. Uh, Keep seeking the things above where your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what we're told. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It wasn't that you were sick. It wasn't that you were kind. You know, David doesn't say, I'm a pretty good guy, and every now and then I do bad things. David is saying, I need you to create a new heart in me, to create a pure heart. You were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. Yet God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us. Here's what Jesus did. That video that's being shown in Mercedes-Benz, and you realize it, that it's your life and all the, the horrible deeds that you've ever done, and as you're running out, you happen to see in the corner of your eye that instead of your face on that body, it's Jesus' face. What he has done is God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. He set it aside, nailing it 
to the cross. Why the eighth day? I have to admit I don't know, but I have two guesses. Uh, one, Jesus rose on the eighth day. That is the first day of the second week. First day of new creation. That might be what it is, just as God spoke light on the first day. He's speaking true light, just as God gave the first fruits on the uh, uh, Sunday. He's giving the ultimate first fruits of Christ. And maybe Jesus rising from the dead, that being circumcised on the eighth day is pointing forward to that. Uh, I don't know. I do know that uh, Jews and uh, Greeks, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but they didn't have a number system. Did you know that? Like we have one, two, three, four. That goes back to the Middle Ages and Arabs. That's why it's called the Arabic numeral system. Uh, what Jews had and what Greeks had was their alphabet. And so they just use their alphabet as their number system. Well, if you use your alphabet as your number system, what is true of every single word in the language if you use your alphabet as your number system? It has an inherent number. And believe it or not, you can actually buy a computer program that will let you paste any word in Greek or Hebrew and it'll tell you what the inherent number is. I wonder where this is going. I wonder why I'm talking about the gematria and the meaning of names because I wonder the, the greatest name in the, uh, in the uh, Bible, the name above every name, uh, is the one given to the Lord Jesus. And I wonder what the gematria of Jesus' name, if we just took the word Iasis and just placed it uh, in, and uh, through the magic of television, I suppose that's what we're going to do. Uh, because when we paste in the word Iasis, uh, it will tell us what the gematria is. And we, when we paste it in, the Asus is 888. Eight. That's really weird when you think about man's number being what? 666, uh, six, 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 like Nero Caesar's uh, name is 666, six, six, and maybe it's something to do with that. But it's interesting that man is created on the sixth day, and, and Jesus is rising from the dead on the eighth day, and circumcision on the eighth day, and they're eight pieces that walk, uh, Abraham walks, uh, or that God walks between when he makes the covenant. And then lo and behold, the number of Jesus' name, 888. I wonder, I wonder if God is more M. Night Shyamalan-like than we give him credit of building the details of the story. Uh, that's what uh, gets my vote. But someone might say, okay, um, why is it bloody male only pointing forward uh, in that Jesus undergoing the circumcision of the cross is cutting away our old men? But what about this thing with Levi and the rape of Dinah? Surely a Christocentric metanarratival approach can't do anything with that story. Well, I don't know. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the beginning, middle, and end of it all. Uh, Jesus said it's all about him. Not only the easy ones, the hard ones are about him. And remember the details of that story? Do you remember we're told where that rape happened? That it was a place... Uh, Shechem. Do you know there's another story that happens at Shechem in the Bible? It's the glory of God to conceal things, the glory of kings to search them out. 
these stories are repeating themselves over and over and over again. Do you know there's another thing that happens right here at Shechem? Well, there's a bunch of things that happen at this place. One is in the Old Testament, this is where the covenant blessings and curses happen. All the bad children of Jacob uh, get up on the top of Mount Ebal, uh, 330,000 men, and they're shouting out, what happens to you if you disobey the law? If you disobey the law, you're going to die of thirst. You're going to have darkness. You're going to have someone else sleep with your uh, wife on your uh, wedding night. You're going to suffer only lack, and you're going to lose everything. And then the good sons of Jacob, 330,000, are all on Mount Gerizim, and they're shouting out the covenant blessings, what you get if you follow uh, God. And then right in the middle, you see right in the middle between those two mountains, is Jacob's well. And so when we're thinking about the rape of Dinah, and we're thinking about this is the place where Abraham first went into the promised land. This is the place where Joshua brings the people for the covenant renewal ceremony. This is all happening at Jacob's well. And I don't know if you know it or not, but there's another thing that happens at Jacob's well in the Bible. Jesus comes to Jacob's well. And there's a woman there. Does this story sound familiar? And she's been sexually abused. She's been uh, used by different men, passed from one man to another, and she's an outcast of society. And she's at Jacob's well. Well, Levi in the Old Testament, who, you know, all the priests are Levites. Did you know that? Moses is a Levite. Uh, all the priests are Levites. Levi comes to this town, and when there's a woman who's sexually abused, his solution is, let's use God's religion to kill everybody. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus comes to that exact same place. Jesus comes to a woman who's been sexually abused. And do you know what happens with Jesus? That woman converts to Christianity. And she is so overwhelmed about the grace that she's gotten by Jesus that she goes and tells the whole town, oh, wow, that's interesting. Levi ends up using Yahweh worship to murder the whole town. This woman, when she is saved, takes that grace, and the result is the whole town is converted to Christianity. This is all happening, Shechem, Sychar, Ebal, Gerizim, all happening at the same place. And this is the actual well where it happened. 115 feet uh, from the top of that well. Think of a 10-story building. Uh, somebody in Jacob's time was lowered on a rope and with uh, a chisel and hammer uh, chiseled through 115 feet of rock and created this well. And they've been using this well uh, for um, uh, three, uh, 4,000 plus years. This is the very place where it happened. This is the place where Dinah was raped. And Jesus can come to the woman and is the woman a law follower or a law keeper? When, if she were at the ceremony that said, this is what you get if you've broken the law, and this is what you get if you follow the law, is that woman a law follower or a law a breaker? She's been sexually abused, but she's done her part too because Jesus, when she says, I have no husband, he says, that's true. The husband you have now is a husband, just not your husband. This woman was sexually abused, but she was also a lawbreaker. 
and if she were standing at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, what she would hear is, you will die of thirst. You will uh, undergo darkness at midday. Your enemies will triumph. You will lose. You will lack until you are driven mad. That's what should have fallen this woman. What should have fallen Jesus? Had he followed the law? Had he broken the law? He followed the law. He had earned the covenant blessings. So how can he promise this woman the blessings? He can promise this woman living water because he's giving her the blessing that he's earned. He's giving his circumcision the pain that he endured, the obedience that he won. He's giving that to any who will come to him by faith. And he's not stopping there. He's transforming their lives to make them men and women of whom the world is not worthy. Jesus Christ is the beginning, middle, and end of it all. And I think Jesus Christ makes even something as difficult as circumcision uh, make sense. So 